Before the Pharisees came along to mangle the law of Moses, its original design was to teach Israel one basic principle, that all people fall short of God's perfect standard and that all sin must be punished with death before a holy God. It was really that simple. If you have sinned, you deserve death. Either you pay that debt of death yourself or you can transfer your guilt to an innocent creature and sacrifice it on your behalf. But there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. What they didn't realize was that this was an exact picture, a mere foreshadow of what Jesus, the promised Messiah, was going to do for them. Jesus was going to come into the world, live a pure and unblemished life, thereby fulfilling the moral and social parts of the law of Moses perfectly, and then, having done so, just like those blameless sacrificial lambs, he would willingly have the sin of the world imbued into him, so that the ceremonial punishment of death that we deserve could be carried out in his body. He was going to be God's own sacrifice for our sin. He would be put to death by crucifixion, taking our guilt upon himself, so that we could be forgiven and go on living. This is why Jesus is referred to in the Bible as the sacrificial Lamb of God. The prophecy given to Jeremiah about a Messiah from King David's lineage all those years ago would come true. Indeed, all the prophecies about Jesus would come true, for there was more than just one prophecy regarding what the Messiah was going to do. The Old Testament contains upwards of 300 prophecies about Jesus starting way back in Genesis, and when Jesus eventually arrived, he fulfilled them perfectly. This is one of the ways that we know the Bible is divinely inspired. Mathematician Peter Stoner calculated that the chance of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies about Jesus by chance was one in ten to the power of seventeen, which is one with seventeen zeros after it. Stoner further calculated that one man fulfilling just 48 of the Old Testament prophecies by chance would be 1 in 10 to the power of 157. When we start considering how one person could fulfill over 300 prophecies by chance, we get into figures that are impossible to comprehend. The maths alone tells us that Jesus' arrival, death and resurrection was by divine appointment. One of the most famous prophecies of what Jesus was going to do comes from Isaiah, who wrote the following passage a full 700 years before Jesus arrived. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, he was beaten so we could be whole, he was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away, we have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life has made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honours of a victorious soldier, because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. All of these things, written hundreds of years before Jesus' arrival, came true. Jesus was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sin. God laid on him the sins of us all. The Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our sin was imbued into Jesus to the extent that he became sin itself. Therefore, the punishment for that sin could be carried out on the cross in his body. And this was more than just a neutral animal like a goat or a lamb like in times of old. This was God himself in human flesh taking our punishment upon himself. This was the one through whom heaven and earth itself had been created. He left his throne in heaven to come dwell among us and to die for us. 
And when I say us, I mean all of us. For God loved the whole world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Unlike the Old Testament sacrificial system where one person would bring one sacrifice to bear his own sin, Jesus had the sin of the whole world laid upon him. This created a way for anyone to claim freedom from death through that one sacrifice. Paul says, Christ has rescued us from the curse of death pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. He died for us. He died for you. As astonishing as it is that Jesus, the Son of God, would freely sacrifice himself for us like that, things would get even more astonishing still. Because when lambs were sacrificed under the law of Moses, they generally stayed dead. The Lamb of God, however, would not. Having laid down his life to pay the debt for our sin, on the third day, Jesus rose again from the grave, conquering death in the process, and in his triumph, he won the power to raise us from the dead too. As Jesus himself put it, because I live, you also will live, and I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. This is why Paul triumphantly exclaims, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ is the pivotal event in world history. Jesus came to provide an escape route from death itself, the death that we all naturally deserve, and to offer us eternal life.